Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. I just, I want to start by saying, uh, again, thank you to Ryan and VN for bringing me on. I, uh, I put a bug in their ear early and I've been on them for, you know, weeks, weeks to months now. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be here and be able to participate in this. Um, I think this is such a great platform, like Ryan was saying, to uh, get everybody together and talking a little bit. Um, like Ryan said too, you know, for me, this is very informal. Um, I've tried to gather some of the most recent research, um, and come of some of my own little, uh, clinical pearls, but if anybody has any questions as we go or wants to chime in, um, you know, I, would be, I'm more than happy. I'm, I'm learning all the time as are we all. So I'm more than happy to uh, have that discussion as well. And I'm hoping that this stimulates some really good discussion afterwards. So, um, like Ryan said, focusing today on, really optimizing that early to mid-stage rehab after ACL reconstruction. Um, that's, that's sort of been a, a difficult point for many clinicians, um, even though there's a lot of research out there um, on ACL reconstruction. So hopefully giving you guys some ideas um, and learning from you all as we go through this as well. So just briefly, I know we all are well aware of the epidemiology of, of ACL injury, um, but just to review that as an overview, um, there are over 200,000 ACL injuries annually in the U.S. Um, generally speaking, these affect females greater than males. About one in 60 female athletes suffers a, an ACL injury. Um, and overall, once you have that first injury, you are at six times higher risk of a second injury in the first two years after the initial ACL reconstruction. So um, again, that risk is greater in females. Um, a lot of the time, you know, what we're considering is our, is our return to sport testing um, adequate for returning these athletes to the high levels that they were at previously. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the research coming out has shown that even at the time of return to sport and persisting after return to sport, there are knee extension strength and central activation deficits which persist. And that can either be um, looking at limb symmetry index and also overall torque um, normalized to body weight. Uh, in some of the studies as well. And we even see that in the contralateral limb, there are deficits in, in central activation ratio as well. So how can we uh, address this in the most optimal way early and get a head start on some of these, these deficits that do persist? So before even touching on early and mid-stage, I wanted to briefly just talk about pre-op rehab because I know Hopefully, you know, at Duke and at Hopkins, I know there's a lot of, um, most of the surgeons are pretty good about sending patients to us before they go in for ACL reconstruction. Um, this is just such a critical piece to how athletes do later on in, in rehab and return to sport as well. Um, there's a, quite a bit of research out there now that pre-op quadricep strength is related to um, post-op quadricep strength at return to play and after return to play as well. Um, so most of the research is in the short term, um, one to two years out, but there, is some long, there are some long-term studies as well. Looking at isometric endurance and the extension range of motion deficits, those seem to be most um, predictive of what that strength is going to look like early on. So we sort of want to address those early in the rehab process, even before surgery and early after surgery. Athletes who had a, a higher preoperative Tegner activity level tended to have an improved outcome at 22 months after surgery. So again, looking close to two years out. Um, and looking at the effects of combined pre and post-op rehab, there was a tendency to have an improved self-reported function at two years post-op um, for those who did pre and post versus just post-operative rehab. Generally speaking, this pre-op phase um, Buck Thorpe released a recent, uh, recent article that discussed that this should optimally be about five to six weeks at least, um, just kind of thinking about our normal rehab timelines to really try to normalize some of the, the early uh, factors before they go in for surgery to help with optimizing post-op outcomes. So just thinking about early and mid-stage rehab as a whole, um, our goals tend to look at really some of these factors that are key early on. So thinking about um, normalizing the range of motion. Now, what, is, what does that mean? You know, there's different studies out there that say different things, but um, some of them that I've seen say zero to 20, 120, zero to 130, um, pretty much trying to get equal. I always think about it as equal to the contralateral limb. Um, also with this, you know, this used to be more time-based. Now we're thinking, you know, that there is a tissue healing component, but now more, maybe more criteria-based versus time-based at this, at this stage as well. Um, looking at knee extension strength, so trying to 
at this time, you know, really, really maximize that knee extension strength. And um, for, for Buckthorpe, again, in his article, he focused more on um, the neuromuscular components. So making sure that somebody at the going into this early to mid, mid stage piece that they were able to progress to be able to do a straight leg raise 10 times without a, a quad lag um, to progress from the early to the mid stage. Reducing pain, effusion, and quadriceps inhibition. So trying to allow, uh, reduce that arthrogenic inhibition and allow the muscle to work optimally um, and allow the patient uh, to load within their tolerance and build that load over time. And then to normalize, normalize gait mechanics, which again is, is a pretty uh, subjective way to look at things, but um, looking at, you know, are we, are we seeing any antalgia? Are we able to normalize those mechanics early? So I wanted to discuss instead of talking about how to, how to return somebody after ACL reconstruction, what I wanted to really focus on was how do we optimize outcomes early in ACL reconstruction rehab? Um, maybe giving you a few ideas or touching on some things that may have been discussed before, but discussing the rec more recent research. So the first thing to think about is kinesio taping. And I know there's a lot of um, kind of controversy out there with kinesio taping, a lot of research showing different things. Um, but I think for, you know, for edema management postoperatively, there is some support, there is some evidence supporting the use of kinesio taping early on. Um, it really, it can work to kind of lift and pull the, the structures overlying the knee area to allow some of that lymphatic drainage early. And um, there is a recent systematic review that came out that discussed this more in depth and showed that there may be some support for it. Um, the results of that systematic review were that there is ultimately more research needed, but it is something to, to consider in your, in your early post-op rehab. Um, with some of the studies that have come out on kinesio taping for post-operative edema, um, they've shown some decrease in peripatellar swelling improved pain management, improved knee flexion range of motion, and also maybe from like a neuromuscular perspective, early increased hamstring muscle strength, um, obviously. So this, this study specifically showed five days after uh, surgery, so we're not seeing true strength gains at that point, but maybe more of a neuromuscular or uh, you know, decreased inhibition effect at that point. Consideration of aquatic therapy. So Obviously not everyone has access to aquatic therapy, but this is a really good early intervention to consider to reduce, especially reduce edema, um, reduce pain, kind of offload the structures a little bit um, and allow working on sort of that motor control component that, that Ryan discussed a little bit last week, um, but also allowing the, the patient, the athlete to um, do some more functional movement in an environment which may not be as stressful to their joint structures early on. Um, so again, Buckthorpe discussed this in several articles or several recent articles um, in terms of the role of pain and swelling reduction, um, working on gait. So talking about that normalization of gait as a criteria to progress through to the mid stage of rehab. Um, the also working on cardiovascular fitness. So obviously that's a good way with the, the hydrostatic pressure of the water to work on that resistive component, um, developing some cardiovascular fitness in a less uh, loaded environment to work on motor pattern retraining early. Um, because obviously if we're loading without having retrained those motor patterns, we may be promoting um, some irritation and pain in the knee joint, not to mention um, suboptimal motor patterns. Earlier introduction of plyometrics and power training, which I know Ryan's going to go a little bit more into in a certain way uh, later on, but that can be a good environment to, again, to do that in a less loaded environment um, early on to support the recovery of this athlete and also for optimal load management. So again, trying to load the athlete appropriately without increasing pain and um, inhibition in that, in that quadriceps specifically. So when we talk about loading optimization or optimal loading, what exactly does this mean? So for me, and this was what the way Buckthorpe, uh, I thought he, he introduced this really well, his definition was the load applied to structures that maximizes physiological adaptation. Um, so basically thinking about in any phase of rehab, what is the, what is the optimization of what, we're, what load we're putting through the joint and how are we achieving this? So a lot of the time, you know, with ACL rehab, we're with later stages and trying to move into earlier stages, we're talking about how do we maximally load this quad um, and get it strong, as strong as possible um, before we return to sport. Um, early on, this can be difficult because, you know, you've got some of these effects that I talked about with uh, arthrogenic inhibition, swelling, pain. If you're just trying to load that joint, that joint's not going to be very happy as we move through the rehab process. 
Um, and you may actually see one thing that Buckthorpe talks about that, again, I found pretty, pretty interesting is that concept of isolated versus functional strengthening early, because if you're trying to load them into a functional strengthening position like a squat or a deadlift, and they are using compensatory patterns, that's probably not going to develop the, the muscle optimally early and allow them to use that muscle then later. They'll probably use strategies to compensate and then you may not get that quad return that you're looking for. Um, so one concept there is trying to focus on machine-based strengthening early um, and isolated strengthening early from that four to 12 week period, kind of in that end stage early, early stage um, or early mid stage rehab to optimize, optimize the loading and optimize um, quad and hamstring strength specifically um, with incorporation of some other muscle, muscle loads as well. Um, again, considering the load capacity of the joint. So really thinking about where are we early? Um, what can this joint handle? And what, how maybe want, may we want to progress that to make sure that we're not irritating early and causing um, pain, which then may set us back even farther. So early on, very high re intensity resistance training may actually adversely affect and stress that healing tissue. So we may actually want to consider more of a, a low load to fatigue at this point, um, really allowing the type two muscles to, or type two muscle fibers to be recruited at, as you fatigue out, but not putting that high stress through the joint that we may be looking at later in rehab. Um, and then, you know, Buckthorpe talks too about the, you know, what, what is actually optimal here in terms of what are we looking at for repetition max and, uh, and how are we progressing that through the stages? So considering starting maybe with that, again, that low load to fatigue, maybe looking at about 12 to 20 rep max and um, late in the early mid stage process. And then later on moving to about an eight to 12 rep max um, and, and looking at six to 10 sets there to really, to really uh, periodize that training program and maximize strength as the, the load capacity of the knee increases. We also, we don't wanna forget about the hamstrings. I know I mentioned those briefly, but um, there, especially after hamstring autograph, there has been shown um, to be some selective semitendinosus muscle atrophy in, uh, in those patients. And so we really want to focus on at this point quad first, but also not forgetting about the hamstrings. Um, once, if they are hamstring, if they're coming back with a hamstring graft, once they have, you know, gone past the, the healing phase of that, that graft area. So taking into that, that into consideration as well. We also want to take into consideration that um, 12 weeks post-op, you actually do tend to get a a, fun, a, a change in the, the functional demands of the task um, when you're doing functional strengthening from the knee to the hip. So again, if you don't have a strong quad and a quad that doesn't, that you've, you've worked to move out of that arthrogenic inhibition stage and the early rehab stage to where it actually has increased load capacity, you may see that these athletes are not able to take the load through that quad and that's where you see these compensations. So even more evidence to work early on um, reducing arthrogenic inhibition and pain and, and effusion and trying to improve the load capacity of that, that quad. Another modality that has been found to be pretty useful recently um, is blood flow restriction. And I know most of us are, are well familiar with this, but it, there are some good studies out there that show that even pre-op and early post-op, um, it's kind of, you can use it in preconditioning to reduce endurance and to improve endurance, reduce endurance loss and prevent atrophy, um, which really will help to kind of reduce that floor and keep, your, keep you higher to start with, which then will improve your overall rehab process. There, there have been some studies looking at blood flow restriction, which typically, again, is 15 to 30% of one rep max, so low load, um, compared to high load resistance training at you know, 70 to 81 rep max, looking at whether that builds um, similarly or differently across those two conditions. Um, there, has, there have been some good studies that have shown that early on, you get similar muscle hypertrophy and strength adaptations with blood, blood flow restriction at low loads versus high load training, which again, can also has also been shown to reduce pain and um, improve uh, overall tolerance to the activity early in the process. Um, generally, it does take a little while. So some of the studies have shown that, you know, they're with short duration blood flow restriction, and they were looking at like a 13 day program, you don't see necessarily those, um, those changes, adaptive changes. But if you continue that out for um, 
you know, five to 10 to 15 weeks that can actually um, give pretty good, pretty similar effects to high load training early on in the process. Um, also considering again that these joint, they, these patients are not going to have the load capacity um, that you might expect later on in the process. So really, so we want to load them, but we want to be cognizant of that. Um, early, you know, you want, you want to really focus on muscle size, which again, that the BFR can be a component to that. Um, the voluntary activation, so working on exercises, you know, using, using different modalities to try to just activate those muscle fibers. Again, to fatigue is one option. Um, using, we'll talk about um, briefly, just some other options for that uh, later on, and then working on, on building strength. Um, generally with BFR, like I said, you get, you get improve, an improvement in self-reported function as well beyond just the pain and edema, the objective measures. Um, and then early reduction of arthrogenic inhibition, allowing us to then progress into more of that, that pure loading stage. So talking a little bit about neuromuscular training, um, early on this is a little controversial just because you know, we want to incorporate this into the program, but um, we don't want to incorporate it at the expense of strength and, and range of motion work, of course. Um, there has been some good work that NMES, as we all know, um, early on allows us to um, improve activation of the muscle fibers and um, improve the percentage of fibers that are activated. Uh, before we start into pure loading, um, there has also been so there have also been several studies on the use of FES in gait training um, to work on uh, sort of more that functional muscle activation, early motor control, and that has been shown to decrease arthrogenic muscle inhibition, which again is kind of one of our main goals early in this, these stages. Um, and then looking at also improving long-term limb symmetry index, so um, trying to get that quad firing early so that we can then work to build it up. And looking at the quad specifically versus other movers, um, obviously quad is our focus, but we may be able to involve other groups with this as well um, with use of neuromuscular training. Um, but like I said, not forgetting about our strength and range of motion early. So moving a little bit into um, just to kind of wrap things up a little bit here, um, talking about closed kinetic chain versus open kinetic chain activation um, and loading. So Typically, we, we all, we tend to start with clothes, of course, um, just thinking about those, the tibial, anterior tibial shear forces and also the patellar, patellar loads through the, the, the lower extremity, um, also very graft dependent, but um, the, the evidence in, the t in talking about closed static chain, you know, we want to focus on quad, of course. Um, again, those isolated muscle positions are best. Um, thinking about, you know, leg press, eccentric work to work again long term toward those deceleration movements that we need for sport specific specific tasks um, but then also thinking about you know our single our single leg squat trying to load that leg a little later in the in the mid-stage rehab process um, per tolerance um, but also thinking about other areas that we might be able to load in a closed kinetic chain way so lumbo pelvic, lumbo -pelvic hip tricep surrey um, thinking about the fact that with lower extremity injury you tend to have some glute inhibition as we all know so um, also considering the fact that you tend to have um, some medial hamstring, some difficulty regaining medial hamstring activation, especially after hamstring um, graft, but in any case, so trying to think about selective medial hamstring loading as well um, with both knee, do knee dominant and hip dominant exercises. Um, some of the options out there might be, um, and again, we, we're all pretty good at choosing exercises, but some options might be the Nordic hamstring curl um, and then consideration of, of using tibial internal rotation position with hamstring exercises to really activate that medial hamstring. All right, so this chart, I really like this chart. It was from um, a, the Zebus article in just last year, um, just talking about some body weight exercises and thinking about the phases of rehab. Um, so moving as you move into later stages of mid-stage and even into late stage rehab, um, basically what this is showing is from the article, the selective activation with EMG of different muscle groups. So you're looking at, you know, biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and then the quads, um, really trying to see if, as we go through the rehab progression with typical exercises, we might choose in those, in each of those stages, whether we're activating the muscles we think we're activating, um, and whether we're increasing that activation as we go through the rehab process. Um, so what I found interesting with this article is the cook hip lift is really, um, of these exercises they selected, and again, this is just a, a smattering of exercises you might choose, um, the, the cook, hip lift was, cook hip lift was really the only one that they chose um, in phase two there from what they considered a hamstring dominant exercise that was more than 60% activating the hamstrings. So, um, you know, some of these, we may not be loading the hamstrings quite as well as we would like them to, or we would like to. Um, I know we all focus 
early on and, and uh, understandably on the quad, but we may need to think a little bit more about our hamstring exercise selection as well. Hey, hey Liz, do you know what the yeah. cook hip lift is? I'm not sure actually what that is. I'm, I don't think I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, so it's a um, good question. I had to look it up too because I've heard of it, but I actually didn't know exactly what it was. So basically um, from what they were describing, it's like a, um, a reverse plank. Your heels are elevated and your one leg is flexed up and then so or one knee is flexed up and then you're just basically doing like a, a reverse plank bridge with a, an extended knee on a, uh, a plinth. So um, kind of like a, yeah, I'm trying to think of, it's hard to describe like, really. Like a no. modified core bridge or bridge? Yeah, yeah, like a modified core bridge. Yeah, that's just like extended knees. Gotcha. Right, and just like single limb, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question, Ryan. Um, so again, the, one of the most controversial things with uh, early stage ACL rehab is the open kinetic chain concept. So how early do we introduce open kinetic chain um, and how do we go about that? Um, there's a, early, our earlier articles showed that there, or there was a potential for, for there to be an increase in laxity long-term. That was what the earlier article showed. More recent articles have showed that maybe that's not as much of a consideration as long as you're careful about the range of motion in which you're working in. So we all know that as you approach terminal knee extension in an open chain position, you're going to increase the anterior tibial shear um, and potentially patellar forces as well. So if you have, you know, if, if you're trying to load somebody early in an open kinetic chain position, you may not want to load them at end range extension. Um, but there, some of the articles out there start as early as four weeks into rehab with 90 to 45 degrees of knee flexion, um, open, open kinetic chain, and find um, that there is no difference in laxity long-term um, in terms of, of ACL laxity. So to me, that indicates um, one of the other considerations with that is what is the impact really on long-term strength? So for me, it's kind of this risk reward, right, for all of us. Um, is it worth introducing it early um, knowing that there may not be a huge impact in on laxity long term, which is great, um, but is it really giving us you know bang for your buck to introduce it that early? Um, a lot of the literature shows that there's not a huge difference in strength long term um, strength differences whether you introduce it at four weeks versus six weeks versus eight weeks versus twelve weeks. Um, I think obviously all of us would agree that this is a huge and important component to rehab to introduce open kinetic chain, but maybe waiting a few extra weeks in my opinion. And I think this comes down also to talking to your surgeon about what he or she thinks about the process as well and, and how that how that surgery went. Um, because I know this is a pretty controversial topic and, and my thoughts on it again are I would wait a few extra weeks, but there has been no, um, no recent evidence to show that there is increased long-term laxity with early introduction of open kinetic chain. Um, also con considering the graft type, um, it looks from, the, from some of the research out there that hamstring grafts tend to potentially require a little more time before open kinetic chain lo loading. Um, there, there tends to be kind of this, um, maybe due to the ligamentous laxity um, that, that's involved there. Um, you just need to wait maybe a little longer. Patellar grafts tend to do a little better with early, early open kinetic chain loading. Um, and then uh, one paper that I found that actually was pretty interesting to me considering types of open kinetic chain loading, um, one thing they suggested was potentially thinking about like early in, really early in the rehab process, first few weeks, um, having somebody in sort of a, a slight knee flexion position and then working on activating uh, hamstring and quadriceps together in that position to reduce the anterior shear on the joint. Um, and they actually did find, they looked at it using EMG and they did find that there was a, a protective effect to um, activating the hamstring with a quadriceps co-contraction in, in shallower degrees of knee flexion there. So maybe considering that from an isometric perspective earlier in the rehab process. So, to leave you all here and, and let Ryan take his uh, presentation and go with it, um, Buck Thorpe gave some good recommendations for progression out of the mid-stage into the late-stage rehab um, stage of, of ACL rehab. Um, his criteria, which I felt, I felt like were well-supported from um, the literature that he was citing, included uh, less than one centimeter increase in patellar girth with activity in terms of um, edema, edema um, management. Full knee range of motion, of course. Isokinetics, he was looking at limb symmetry index of greater than, than 80% for knee flexors and extensors. Uh, one word of caution with that, and I know most of us are aware of this, but considering the fact that usually there's some deconditioning in the contralateral limb as well. So if you have those baseline measurements from um, before surgery, making sure that you're strengthening the contralateral limb as you go so that you're not having a false comparison and overestimating how strong that, that involved limb is. 
um, and then looking for at least a, a 0.6 flexion extension ratio as well. Um, leg press strength tests, so you want them to be able to co comfortably tolerate 1.5 times body weight on a, a, a single limb. Um, looking at for both the single leg bridge and calf raise, that endurance component. So can they get 20 repetitions with good form? And is there a less than five degree or five, five rep difference side to side? Looking at single limb balance, the values he cited were 43 seconds or greater with eyes open, nine seconds or greater with eyes closed for that. Um, and then the ability to run 10 minutes at eight kilometers an hour. Um, I didn't really get into return to running. That's a whole different presentation here. But um, thinking about these principles as you move toward that return to run and incorporating them, that's the kind of the benchmark to progress from there. So that's all I have. And hopefully that transitions pretty well into what Ryan's going to talk about. Yeah, that, I mean, Liz, that was awesome. That's a hell of, there's a lot of material that you summed up, but um, you did a great job being able to uh, handle all that um, because there's a lot there. Um, so we, we do have a, a question kind of in the Zoom group chat and you kind of want yeah. to open it up with it, Liz. So, uh, you know, Jenna was just asking any thoughts on initiating that open chain knee extension on quad tendon grafts. How have you done that, I guess, in your practice and any considerations that you would think of? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. Um, I have to say I haven't seen as many quad tendon. I've seen more, way more patellar and, and hamstring. Um, so I probably, I would probably open that up to the audience in case anyone has any thoughts on that. Um, I mean, from a, theoretically, I think I, if I were thinking about the biomechanics, I think, you know, again, it goes back to, I would probably talk to the surgeon first and see what their preference on that is. Um, but I, I might think that just based on the biomechanics of it, you may be able to start that a little, again, on that patellar tendon side of things as well, like a little earlier versus the hamstring graft. Um, but again, I, I think it depends on your surgeon's preferences there. And I didn't see a ton, honestly, in the research on that either. It's a good question. Yeah, and I think partially that has to do with um, quad tendons being a little bit more new. Vien right. uh, kind of chimed in here, just saying that as long as they've got full extension, they're tolerating it well. Um, yeah. I, I have heard about the patellar fractures with BTB, just still anecdotally, just like a personal story from somebody who had, um, so I don't know if anybody has experience with that. I think my overall take on that is just um, basically, you know, kind of treat it almost like an overlying tendinopathy in some ways and start mm -hmm. with your isometric long holds and those kind of safer ranges for the first you know four to six weeks and then progress at the full range of motion after that because you, you need that quad activation we'll kind of highlight that here yep i agree with that ryan um one one thing i actually wanted to pose to the group was is anybody using um just because i do think you know, and you highlighted it with aquatic therapy and the kinesio taping. Is anybody using concepts of like manual lymphatic drainage or short, short stretch uh, uh, bandage wrapping, like preoperatively to really get that edema down, reduce that arthrogenic inhibition, and get them being able to get back into their normal motor control patterns faster? I was curious if anybody's been doing anything like that in their practice at all, because there's just like nothing in the literature about it, I feel like. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up actually, Ryan, because I had that in my notes to mention and I completely glossed over it. But um, I've actually had some good results with using um, short stretch and, and uh, manual lymphatic drainage for these, these patients, both pre-op and post-op. Um, I think it depends you know, on what your goals are and who your patient is. I think I've had some people who just refuse to use the short stretch um, and just hate it. And then some who do better with just you know, manual lymphatic. Um, but I, I have seen that it does in a lot of cases, and again, it's anecdotal because, like you said, there's not much out there about it. Um, these, there are there are some good anecdotal results that I've had with people trying to just um, get that quad firing a little bit more by reducing edema with those techniques. And um, how quick would you do the short stretch? Because it's, I mean, those are a lot more intense. I, it's because it's yeah. uh, like constant pressure with walking. How quick would you do the short stretch after surgery? Yeah, I think for me, I kind of think about it, again, it's not the same as BFR, but like if you're thinking about compression, um, you know, you're, you're, it's a different spot where, where it actually is, but I, I probably would um, give it like maybe a couple a couple weeks, but I'd probably start it pretty, pretty early. Um, I think I'm trying to remember the earliest I've started it with somebody. Usually what I'll do is I'll try um, like a K-tape technique or a manual lymphatic drainage first, and if that's really not doing it, then I'll go more aggressive. 
Um, but I usually do give it a couple weeks before actually trying the short stretch. And I don't know if anybody else has any um, thoughts on that either. I think my, yeah, just to your point, I think they'll be walking around more too after two weeks and you need that muscle activation to get that, that uh, pump type, you know, and that's, I, I really haven't studied short stretch bandages since my wound care class in school and that was now like four years ago. So I asked our woman's health uh, resident about it and she seemed to be, you know, more of a proponent of incorporating it if you're not getting that reduction. But I think it's good to be aggressive, especially preoperatively to get those folks back to, you know, you're trying to reduce that neuromuscular arthrogenic inhibition to the quad, I think, as you go on. So um, if, if, does anybody have any more questions on this half? If not, I'll uh, bring up my slide. I'll stop sharing here for you, Ryan. Hopefully that gives you back the... Yeah, one, one other thing, just as I start my slideshow, this was, I was on a Vault lecture about four stacks the other day, and they were they were advocating basically for this uh, squat testing in the early uh, phases of rehab, um, basically using their software and their program to induce different loads in that early two months to be able to look at what is optimal loading for power. So you know, the thought would be if you load heavier, you're going to move slower. So finding that sweet spot between moving fast enough to generate power, but also having a higher load. And I thought that was uh, a really cool kind of pushing the uh, needle for ACL rehabilitation. Um, so I thought that was something definitely use more kind of in the future going along here. Um, all right. So uh, I wanted to uh, just cover cutting. I think it was a little bit more of a uh, you know, my own almost uh, use of it, because I think it's a subject that isn't obviously really well covered in PT school. And I think it's just such a complex topic that I wanted to just take a little bit of a deeper dive into it. So with starting, we're just going to talk about some definitions here first. Um, I'm going to reference change of direction and cutting as being interchangeable here. Um, so basically, um, oh, excuse me, I advanced that. So basically, uh, cutting and change of direction is used cutting maneuvers sometimes in the literature, um, but also agility uh, is sometimes uh, used. Agility, uh, typically, though, it's going to reference something uh, that uh, you actually are responding to something. So you're not really training agility until you're moving more into um, essentially the ability to respond to an external stimulus. So cutting, change of direction, interchangeable, but agility not so much unless you have that external stimulus that you're responding to, just to kind of lay out some definitions. So when I start um, composing these programs, I think of, it's helpful for me to consider these two main components when working on cutting ability. Um, and I asked myself if the athletes are capable of performing both of those. And so those were two requirements for change of direction include the center of mass must be decelerated in the approach direction and is then accelerated towards the new movement direction. So that kind of switch, I think of it as switching gears really quick from like a reverse to just throwing on the acceleration. I, I have flashbacks of Fast and the Furious anytime I think about this stuff. And then also you need to rotate the body towards that new movement direction as well. So first thing that we're gonna cover here is that center of mass component here. And to do this, we're going to describe this posterior versus this anterior directed ground reaction force, which we'll focus in on this A picture here force. So to me, every cut can be considered a rapid deceleration to acceleration with a change of direction in the middle. I'd argue that that change of direction might be optional if you consider that it's just a sagittal plane type of cut where it's a rapid deceleration to an acceleration. I think those happen a lot in sports as well. And I do think those need to be considered cuts. Um, as you program post-op and ACLR, uh, lower extremity injury. Um, so to achieve deceleration, individuals are gonna need to generate a posteriorly directed ground reaction force by positioning their center of mass, which you can see here, uh, posterior to the center of force application, or in this graphic here, center of pressure, um, which is obviously gonna be their foot. And it's that braking mechanism that allows them to decelerate. And then subjects are essentially going to need to generate that anterior directed ground reaction force um, 
to then push that center of mass anterior to the center of pressure to accelerate in that new movement direction, which isn't pictured here, but I have that in a video here. So that effective transition between deceleration and acceleration in a short period of time frame is one of those key factors for high performance. Basically, are you able to cut well? If you are, you're able to manage this relationship from a, a rapid braking to a rapid acceleration of the lower extremity pretty quick there. And how quickly somebody can manage that is gonna be um, key, but also efficiency as well. And um, basically, you know, I think of it as like almost a jump where you're loading up eccentrically and then you're transferring that to concentric activity and obviously big time neuromuscular control components in there. And then you also need to consider the center of mass relative to the center of pressure in the frontal plane. You need to place that center of mass medial to center of pressure to that de desired direction, which you can see down here as well, just how that center of mass is uh, medial to the center of pressure and that person will be able to go in the desired direction. So what I have here is a uh, video of uh, Chris Johnson here performing this cut. That's the one that we're gonna talk about there just as he approaches, I think about that 50 yard line there, um, totally jukes that guy out of his shoes. So um, in this first picture here, what you can see is he's leaning forward as he approaches that kind of 45 yard mark and he's, he's accelerating through that his center of mass is anterior center of pressure so he's accelerating right and this is why these individuals are just i think the most you know incredible athletes he's still really you know obviously this isn't a perfect side view but he's a little bit more straight up in the next frame as he goes about a yard forward and then here completely puts on the brakes and he's He's fairly vertical, and obviously this is me trying to snap a GIF, and I'm not a video editor by trade, so this is probably the best. I, I tried kind of just to uh, do screenshots of this, and so this is the best video I got. And it's just so impressive to me how strong he is that he's, he's just ever so slightly so straight up, but he's able to basically stop on a dime essentially and completely alter his center of mass, which is probably pretty significant. Um, because he's a heavy, strong dude, to be able to cut to that right side here. Um, and then, as you can see, he's just quickly moving into that accelerated position where the center of mass is now, once again, anterior. Um, and so I think a bonus of this uh, video, too, is a good demonstration of the individual cornerback or safety that's trying to come over and make a hit. Um, good demonstration of not how to optimally decelerate your center of mass. It's, uh, you don't really want the, chi uh, the chest touching the quads in any position in football typically. Um, so just kind of a good little bonus there. Um, so the next concept I want to introduce is basically the angle dependency of a cut. Um, and this has been a really powerful figure for my practice in creating programs um, for cutting. And so it's, it's great schematic here between, you know, the picture of the uh, um, uh, basically the red, yellow, and green light, um, the graph associating uh, with that, as well as the table here describing basically the breaking forces that are encountered in various angled cuts. And so what Dos Santos did was basically took a lot of literature um, in examining, you know, these studies would examine 45s versus 90s or 135s versus 180s. And he looked at basically what was the breaking pattern of the lower extremity. Um, and then he, he basically grouped this into a table just to show what the pattern of a cut would be. So what we have here is this green being that zero to 45 degree range. And so the key with this is velocity maintenance key. So basically you're not gonna have a large breaking force because you're not essentially changing your um, direction that markedly essentially. Um, and so that goes all the way up to that, obviously having a little bit of that yellow area, that 45 to 60 is kind of in between where you're going to have that moderate amount of breaking force. So really kind of putting on that posterior ground reaction force as we just saw uh, Chris Johnson do that. Um, and then, but still, you're still um, basically maintaining that velocity in some way. And then you have those more sharper cuts, that 60 to 180 degree. Um, and that's where you're having that substantial breaking force. And so I think this is, I think it's important to understand the basis of a cut and, you know, really consider all the components that go into it. It's a crazy list of like ground reaction force, ground, re ground contact time, torso position, muscular control, muscular strength, lower extremity biomechanics, surface, you know, friction, the list kind of goes on. And that's why these movements are just so amazing because they're just, it's kind of like a snowflake in one cut isn't ever going to be like another. Um, and so I think 
you need some type of clarity in this this uh, schematic basically provides that for me when I'm uh, creating these programs and it's important to under queue. Uh, I also think bonus here too is just these great external cues of slam on the brakes, slow down and go. Um, we can think about that from the in context of what I presented about last week as well. I also thought it was important to uh, discuss the final foot contact, which is gonna be this person's left foot in this E picture here versus this penultimate foot contact, which is B and C here on the right. Um, so most studies have focused on that final foot contact. And I think coming into athletics, you know, you're always being like, okay, you need to pivot off that final foot contact. We need to focus on that. But what they're finding out is that that penultimate foot contact, so this right foot right before he pivots on that left foot, is actually gonna have a huge role in deceleration um, particularly in those sharper degree cuts of greater than 60 degrees here. Um, and so just there's numerous studies that Dos Santos wrote in this review and reference, but just to give you a little bit of a illustration of the data that he was working with to come to these conclusions, it was basically he found um, in this one study that the final foot contact was playing a much less role in breaking in a 90 degree cut um, than the penultimum foot contact. And then they compared this to a 45 degree cut and they were finding more of the 45, uh, in a 45 degree cut that the final foot contact was pretty even as far as breaking forces between the penultimum and the final foot contact. So I think it just goes to show that in sharper cuts, you're gonna be using more of that opposite extremity to slow yourself down. Um, I think it's also worth noting is that that penultimate foot contact is a little bit more utilized when they have a planned um, cut. So when they're able to time their motor system, to basically put on the brakes for a greater distance. So they see that cut coming, you're gonna see more of that penultimate foot contact to slow them down um, versus the final foot contact when it's unplanned, that's gonna have to take a little bit more of the force. And we'll get into that with uh, pivoting a little bit more and discuss that relationship. So if you're confused a little bit by that, we'll, we'll clarify that a little bit more. I thought it was important to just provide a concise view of what muscle activation is gonna look like in a cut. Um, there is some evidence that greater EMG activity of like your frontal plane musculature being like the bassus lateralis and biceps femoris is seen in sharper cuts. I think that all makes sense to us that you're gonna to have to use muscles that might be a little bit more uh, predisposed to manipulate the body in the frontal plane in a 90 degree cut versus a 45 degree cut. Um, obviously, the quad is being essential for eccentric activation during acceleration. I think we can all understand that, but I think it's, we, we shouldn't understate that importance of uh, these motions are the things that people get in trouble with post-op ACLR. And for myself, I think it's important to kind of put that out there, you know, when you're working in those early and mid stages to be like, hey, we need to get your quad strong because you need to put on the brakes and be able to accelerate and move the way you used to. So that's why we're doing these straight leg raises, that's why we're doing these quad sets, that's why we're doing um, these leg presses, it's because this quad is really gonna be key in doing its job for that deceleration to put on the brakes, and we wanna make sure you don't get in trouble again with these ACLRs. Uh, hamstring activity, that co-contraction, I think Liz touched on that nicely and presented obviously why we're targeting some of the muscles that we're doing. So going back to that first slide with that uh, green arrow, or I'm sorry, that orange arrow and then the circle, that second requirement is gonna be that rotation towards the new movement direction. And so this study by David, I thought did the best job that I've seen in describing that relationship. So what they did is basically a planned 90 degree cut. They used these two force plates here, which are these gray boxes. Um, and of course they, they labeled differently what the final foot contact is versus the penultimate. Uh, foot contact. So approach cut is going to be synonymous with the penultimate foot contact. And then the execution foot is going to be synonymous with the um, final foot contact, which you can see here. And then you're having that pivoting to that depart foot. And so what they did essentially was just a cohort study and they wanted to look at pelvis rotation during this. Um, and so what they did is they, they grouped its participants as either early or late depending on that pelvic rotation at that initial landing at that final foot contact or what they once again called that execution step uh, foot placement. Um, and I thought this was a great illustration of some variability and movement that you're gonna have in rotation of a cut and we'll explain the results here. So this early group demonstrated a pre-orientation angle of the pelvis segment of about 35 degrees 
So before they even hit that execution uh, foot, they were already like almost a third of the way rotated towards that 90 degrees, actually over a third. Um, and so during execution, so while that execution final foot contact is on the ground, they rotate an additional about 20 degrees, 18. And then after the execution, there was a rotation of an additional 35 degrees approximately. And that's in comparison to that late group who had only a pre-orientation of about 20 degrees. I thought it was interesting that both of them in that execution rotation was about 20, 25 degrees. That was similar between the groups. But you can see that late group after execution rotated their pelvis an additional 47 degrees, which is a huge contrast um, from the early group and just showing how there's so much movement variability, um, which you can see appreciated in these graphs. So my big takeaways with this um, was that they were able to actually extrapolate forces and look at also EMG activity as well. And I think that's why it was a cool study to really understand this pivoting motion of the pelvis. So what they found in that first strategy, that early group who had that strong pre-orientation towards that new movement direction of their pelvis, most of their energy was absorbed by the ankle extensor muscles and passive structures. And that was in contrast to the late group who had that predominantly rear foot um, and flat foot strike, which was another strength of the study, was they were able to look at foot contact. So the early group had more of a flat foot, four foot strike. So using those um, ankle extensor muscles, those dorsiflexors to slow down their motion versus individuals in the um, late group were actually using their more of their knee because they had a more of a rear foot strike. Um, and so consequently, that late group had more of a knee extensor muscle um, activity, basically. Um, so using more of a knee force in that late group versus an ankle, more kind of uh, uniform strategy. So my, there's several takeaways, I think, from this study. And my, my thought is they didn't look at that penultimate foot. They didn't have a force plate under it. But my thought is that late group is um, potentially using that penultimate foot less to break than the early group. And my thought is that early group is hitting more with that forefoot and they're able to essentially break with that penultimate foot contact and then spin because they're using less of their hip groups to do that. Um, and so, you know, it, it's easy, I think, to look at this and think, okay, we should train our individuals to turn early, um, to rotate their pelvis early because it's going to be less load through the knee extensors. Um, but my thought is with this is to think of it more of a spectrum when you're programming in this into uh, an athlete's plan of care because there's so many sports that involve positioning the torso um, to deke somebody out and basically to not give up which uh, direction you're going. You know, obviously, I always go back to football, having somebody squared up and he's going to want to keep his chest um, pretty neutral until he has to at the last minute have his chest come with his hips because he doesn't want his opponent which way to know he's going. So my thought is maybe cue early um, on in the rehabilitation to provide less knee extensor moment to rotate that pelvis. And then as you get more into those uh, later stages of sport, be able to uh, then make it more sport specific. Hey, keep your torso more towards this external target because that's what they're gonna do um, on the field. They're not gonna give up their performance um, just at a risk of re-injury because they're not gonna be thinking about that. The only thing they're gonna be thinking about is how do I get around this defender and juke them out. I wanted to include this graph too, just as some drills to prepare uh, to return to the cutting progression. Um, so this is a big, big chart of basically a summary of Dos Santos's article and what he was finding as far as training recommendations. Um, basically, the summary of this is there's lots of lateral bounding, jumping-based exercise. I think those are super useful for the introduction of like horizontal ground reaction forces that you're going to encounter um, to be able to introduce those on when the time is right and when the quad strength is there. Um, and I like to integrate uh, lunges in early stages of rehab for that and then also utilize bands slides as well. Um, but I think it's worth noting that uh, you really need to focus once they're able to do those return to agility and cutting progressions. That's what you need to focus on versus any of these jumping or exercises. You need to train them into that motion. And just I wanted to include this slide as some good ways to start to do that in those early and mid stages. But then just emphasize that once they're able to cut, that's what we need to program and train. And we'll kind of introduce that a little bit more here. So what, what um, evidence is in the literature um, for interventions as far as cutting? So 
Um, I think it's important to really come at this slide first and foremost with that there is um, a lot of evidence out there that unfortunately doesn't show too much uh, carryover to some of these change and modification techniques and some of these balance exercises that we're doing. So I basically cherry picked the studies that did show some changes, but it is worth noting that in the scoping review on Dos Santos on what interventions were changing cutting ability, a lot of things unfortunately wasn't moving the needle. There wasn't differences in control group. It wasn't changing like the abduction moments, anything like that. So this, this study by Dempsey um, investigated the effects of a 45 degree sidestepping modification over six weeks. Um, the intervention consisted of performing sidestep drills with imposed technique changes by bringing the foot closer to the midline. Um, and so they used tape on a floor for this as well as cueing a maintaining of an upright torso position. So you need to have that torso facing towards that direction of travel. Um, participants were provided with oral and video feedback. So some um, retrospective, basically external cueing um, as well as internal cueing. Um, and so what they were able to re uh, demonstrate was this, a decrease in knee abduction moments of uh, over six weeks. So they were having a little bit less of a side step, which is gonna be or reducing that knee abduction moment, that basically that valgus force. But the question is, is that gonna really carry over to competition? Um, there was also wasn't a control group in this, unfortunately. Um, and so this Jones group, um, and so the thought with that, once again, bringing it back to, you need to train these individuals to get in those positions. It's, it's good to maybe move that needle to not push out just as far, but they're once again gonna to try to achieve their athletic goals. Um, so is there really gonna be carryover competition from this? And this wasn't a long-term study that looked at that. Um, so just a limitation on that. And Jones kind of did a similar thing where they had a 180 degree term. This was kind of cool as a six week program and the first one and two weeks, they emphasized deceleration, which I think is important to start with. Then they started with some random greater entry velocity get more variation on how you're, you're gonna essentially cut. And then uh, in the fifth and sixth week, they just randomly performed drills. Um, they did cite that they had, they once again lacked a control group. And they also said that their subjects weren't fast to begin with. It was a pretty small cohort, it was about 10 patients. So once again, the literature is pretty sparse on actual carryover to this. What is pretty well demonstrated, and I think that has the most validity in being able to alter peak knee abduction moments during cutting tasks um, are just gonna be balance training. So these are just two studies here um, that identified basically these balancing interventions that were able to reduce um, peak knee abduction moments. The first one was being really significant. Um, the fact that they had a control group was awesome. Um, the control group actually had an increase in their peak knee abduction moments versus the intervention group obviously had a statistically significant re um, introduction. So I think Basically, these two studies highlight the importance of balance training. I think I can get a little bit tunnel vision with just like strength and range of motion early in the beginning. And, you know, I throw on balance training at the end, but I think it's important to start to prioritize that to have proper motor control um, and to really never lose that motor control or improve their motor control because they tore their ACL for a reason um, post-operatively as they go through. So in summary, when we're creating these programs, I think, these are the variables that you need to continue to come back to um, and the ones that you need to manipulate. So first, we talked about those angles. Think back to that green, yellow, red light, just to basically give you some clarity in what my braking forces and my patterns are gonna be. And kind of grouping these, I think, in a zero to 45 group, 45 to 60 group, a 90, a 135, and a 180 cut. Obviously, you'd modify these based on your athletes and what their sports demands are, their position demands are. But that's kind of how I break those down. And then obviously speed and intensity is going to have a huge factor in determining cutting motion. So I like to start at about 50%. I won't go lower than that because you're just not going to have carryover into the sport. I like to quickly be at 50% just to give my athletes some confidence in their ability to cut. But then I'm going to be pretty aggressive with trying to pro progress greater than 70 degrees of intensity. If you've got the catapult type things to monitor speed, great, use them. If you've got some speed gates, once again, use them. But um, sometimes you don't have either one of those, which I'll show you in a second here. And so I think just using intensity in like an outpatient setting and being like, all right, this week you're at 50%, next week 70, 90% after that. Um, being mindful of acute to chronic workloads, 
I even count foot contacts too to describe what my external load might be, trying to monitor internal load, how the uh, athlete's doing as far as rating perceived exertion, maybe multiply those together to get some quasi type rating on how they're doing. Um, just consider what your total volume of your program is. And then finally, I think the really important thing to do is uh, look at reaction because they're gonna have completely different strategies um, based on how they're reacting. Pre-planned cutting is completely different from reactive cutting. Um, and I like to introduce basically early in rehab. I don't really use a right versus left command. I don't use color commands. What I do is I, back when I was working in rugby, I'd grab a rugby ball and hold it in my hands. And basically I was never a rugby player, but just pretend that I was throwing the ball either to the right or left and making my athlete respond to that because those are the external stimuli that they are going to have to adapt to when they're on the field. They're gonna to have to adapt to opponent's position, physically what their GPS position is, and then they're gonna to have to adapt to their opponent's body language. So why not start that early, start that motor control early and get that going? I think there is some room for verbal cueing as well, listening to coach to commands, listening to uh, um, uh, co-athletes, teammates commands, co-athletes. Um, just being able to go on and modify those things. So I have a really quick example program of basically I had this athlete with a groin strain, coronavirus happened. So this is my stripped down uh, athlete at home working on his backyard. And this is all I was able to kind of provide him with. So this is just starting at 50, 60%. This is a week one. You can see this wasn't a knee injury. So it was a groin injury. So I felt more confident in introducing some of those dynamic cutting motions earlier on. And so we can see what I want to focus on is getting that intensity up. So I'm not worried about increasing volume right away. What I want to focus on is are they able to tolerate the intensity at this volume and then increase that volume once they're able to get that intensity up um, because you have to train them to move at these speeds, right? We have to train them to move at their braking forces um, and then we can increase those volumes more into their game demands. So this is about two or three weeks later. Um, I was already up from 50 to 90 to 100 percent because, once again, this is a non-op um, case. So a little bit of a less co correlation to maybe the ACL talk, but it was just a good example. And you can see here increasing not only the intensity, which is the main focus of this, but also increasing the distance into that deceleration, um, five steps versus four steps before, which we're increasing, you know, roughly at about 25 percent clip there of thinking the intensity because if they have more time to get into that deceleration, um, they're going to be running faster and having more braking forces to deal with. And then you can see this is about two or three weeks later. And then he was, he was doing really well with his intensity. So getting more into those sharper cuts and then also imposing more sports specific motion. So multiple cuts in a quick space. This athlete sport involved uh, quick cuts in a small amount of space. Um, so this wasn't, this wasn't a football athlete, um, just being able to go in and quick cuts and a small amount of space and trying to really tie that back into their sports. And then last thing here, um, I think it's important to consider, um, not only just objective testing, I think having these field-based return to play tests, these shuttle runs, karaoke tests, something they call the co-contraction test, which is just lateral cutting five times around this, um, a semicircle here. Uh, you can look up norm values, and I think it's useful to have um, for these tests to be able to be like, okay, this person's performing the karaoke test um, at an age match norm or uh, something that's represented in the literature. But for myself, I think the thing that I cue in more um, that I've really taken away from the fellowship is can they play their sport? So looking at what their norm values are, you know, looking at a study with GPS technology or looking at what their you know, own GPS technology uh, norms for, and then creating that rehabilitation program, that cutting program to match those demands. If they're accelerating, decelerating times 100 times in a match. Are they able to do that in a pre program? Great, perfect. So then we're going to integrate maybe more external cues, um, how they're playing their sport, and start to integrate players into that maybe put them in a non-contact practice and progress into there. And that's my ultimate, ultimate litmus test um, for getting back and completing the return to cutting program, which I think is going to be an important component and uh, hope to see more literature on that moving forward. So with that, opening this up to some discussion here. Um, 
and just how do you um, progress cutting post-operatively? Are there any drills that you like to uh, basically integrate? Um, anybody can jump in there, see if I've got anything in the chat as we open that up. Yeah, so I think it's really important what you talked about, like the reactive component to it. Um, I don't remember the reference off the top of my head, but there was a study where they taught cutting mechanics to patients, looked at the biomechanics with it, and then just putting a skeleton at the point where they had to do the cut uh, for the experiment, and they just went back to their other their old mechanics with something simple as that, even with the pre-programmed task. So just progressing from a closed environment to an open environment, trying to add those reactionary things into it um, to get that carryover, uh, I think is super important. Yeah, I think that's absolutely, I think that's a great idea to use a skeleton because every clinic's got a skeleton, or a lot of them do at least, um, to be able to kind of cue that and, you know, maybe enter in another body. I think you can early maybe use like kind of those big kind of popsicle type things, but also there's, there's always a lot of athletic training and PT interns around and positioning them on the field and maybe making the athlete close their eyes in the beginning and be like, all right, you need to cut in front of these, all these people. And this is, and randomly placing them. I think that's kind of a good idea to start to incorporate that external stimuli. Hey, Ryan, I'll add in um, dowel marches, wall marches, um, lateral and sideways. I feel like that just one makes them feel like an athlete again early on. So this is when they can just start walking normal. I'll start adding that early on. And then I feel like that'll, um, prepare them for the movements later on in the mid to late stage rehab. Do you do those in the pool at all? Uh, I don't do those in the pool. I feel like those are fairly um, low impact. Uh, for the pool, I'll just do running, and then I'll do shuffling um, with the pool at about a uh, nipple line and seeing if they can tolerate that, and then I'll move it lower. Ryan, one of the things that I'll include is asking them how they feel. So if they're going at 75% at speed for whatever whatever drill they're doing, um, I'll ask them, like, okay, this is 75% of your perceived effort. How do you feel confident-wise? Um, I'll do both sides. So if they've got to cut right versus cut left, okay, if the left is 100% in terms of confidence, where's the right? And I won't progress to 76% until – they look good at 75% and they report 100% confidence with it. So I may hang around that 75% speed for, you know, really a long time, you know, based on where they feel. Um, and, and I think that helps to build a rapport where like, I'm not trying to push you faster, you know, no pun intended. Um, let them give them some control in the manner and then let them guide like, all right, I feel good. This feels normal. All right, let's, let's go a little faster. And then you may, you know, they may get to like 90% and that feels fine and they're ready to go. Um, then the other thing is, is I probably won't add the, the reactive cutting until that they can cut at 90% plus at full speed or not full speed with full confidence, look good. Um, because otherwise, like, I just don't want to bring in another variable. Like, I don't want to do reactive cutting at, let's say, 50% speed because that, that never happens. Um, so I usually just save that to last. Yeah, and what I think the program that I included just had, you know, it's obviously not even a post-op case, it's a hip case. So um, totally agree, just like trying to be systematic as you move on and then respond to them, how their joints tolerating and then how they're themselves kind of tolerating and their, their confidence in it. And I think it's really important to kind of stay on top of that and, as you said, have that dialogue and kind of let them progress themselves in a way. That's really, really good point there, Rick. I really appreciate that. So Rick, if, if you're not adding in any reactive components until they're closer to 100%, are you taking into consideration like the retention and some of the motor learning stuff like we had talked about last week with Ryan's presentation? Where I mean with the, um, the reactive stuff is if you're going to do, um, 
like side shuffling it at 90%, um, I'm going to have you build that up where you're going from cone to cone and you're controlling going left and right versus there are no cones. You're just in the middle of a field or a court and I'm pointing left or right and you got to react on me. But I'll include reactive stuff, kind of the, the neurocognitive stuff that we talked about last week early in therapy. So as part of balance training, as part of strengthening, um, you know, I may use use a ball um you know for the visual reaction with sub max cutting so if they're side shuffling back and forth um i'll be passing a ball but in terms of the like full speed um you're going to run at me and then i'm going to point left to right at the last second you've got to make a 90 degree cut i'm going to save that to last yeah and i I, th I don't know. I think you guys can hear me. Um, I think that's totally, especially from looking at that rotation study where they're going to be able to use more of that breaking force and have less force through the knee in those pre-planned motions. I think that's just a key, huge progression um, to be able to do that without that reactive component. And then you're making that task so much harder with their reactive component. Um, I completely agree. Just trying, you know, trying to incorporate the motor control in other ways, but getting those breaking down, those breaking patterns down pat, and then challenging those breaking patterns more at that hundred percent. If I was doing like a post-op re rehab uh, progression, I definitely think that's where you should start or finish, I should say. Vian, I'm going to ask you the next question, being a product of uh, George Davies' education. Any other specific field testing that you would incorporate postoperatively that you'd like to look at, like norms at all? Uh, no, we'll bring the isokinetics out to the field, and we'll do isokinetics on the field. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> this is like, well, what? <laughs> uh, no, he's a big proponent of the uh, left. So we have some norms for Division three players, multi-center study. Um, and that one, I mean, we'll look at quality, but it's really hard to do it with that speed. Um, but for the most part, we just look at, it's more of a measure of their uh, aerobic capacity, but, um, he's a big fan of that. I mean, he, he knows a ton more that he taught us, but I'd say in our protocol at Gunderson, at least it was to do the, the left, but, um, I'd be after this year, I'd be more, uh, specific to their sport and what their performance coach wants to because the performance coach has all their uh, prior norms and their teammates' norms as well. Does anybody have any other specific field tests that they, they really like to see, like normative value, or is it kind of, are we more, all more leaning towards just like getting them back to what they, their demands of their sport are and what their demands of their position are more so? That, yeah, that doesn't surprise me that we're kind of all leaning towards that second category then. Um, the last question I have, and I'm this is curious, I, you know, there's all these force decks that are coming out, um, and they measure vertical ground reaction forces, and they don't take advantage of, unfortunately, this anterior, posterior, medial ground reaction forces. I was on a presentation that I unfortunately had to leave yesterday. I wanted to ask one of the uh, reps for uh, a force deck, basically, like, because they're programming these tests where they have an individual jump from their right, their left extremity, and, and their thought is it's a medial lateral direction. You're looking at those vertical ground reaction forces. But I just, I wonder if that equipment that they're using isn't actually capturing what horizontal ground reaction force looks like if they're only looking at vertical. I was wondering if anybody had any thoughts on that, how they're incorporating any force decks in this cutting type task. Um, are these cutting type tests to objectively look at things? I think we might have crickets on that. So maybe I'll talk to the rep and uh, get back to everybody at a later date and kind of see if I can get any insight on uh, ways to use those force plates that are only measuring vertical ground reaction forces, I guess, in those cutting tasks and see what those applications are. 
Um, Brian, I'll, I'll chime in on that a little bit. Uh, this is Keith from UW Madison. We use force plates, but we have the anterior, posterior, and medial lateral direction, but we strictly mainly use those for running. Um, we don't do it with cutting at this point. Um, and if you are only using the vertical ground reaction force for something such as cutting, you're missing you're missing a lot uh, from that. So uh, yeah, I would be concerned. I would have a hard time interpreting a simple vertical ground reaction force um, and saying that that is um, an important measure to look at for cutting. For running, we're even seeing pretty big differences in the anterior posterior, not the medial lateral, because you're not you don't have much medial lateral motion. But that is something to consider. Is definitely the direction of that movement. Ryan, I'll um, chime in quick. Sorry, <laughs> I'll chime in real quick on that too. Actually, um, I I've been doing a lot of these Zoom meetings, obviously, over this time, and um, we had uh, talked by Chris Powers a few weeks ago, and um, he's coming out with some stuff soon. He does a lot. Of, he's been doing a lot of work with like return to play um, using uh, some of the cutting data um, with the force plates that he has out at USC, um, and I know they're going to come out with some stuff at the end of this year uh, regarding that. So I think they're we're kind of right on the edge, and, and there may be some stuff coming out soon on that. Um, but I agree with you. I think every, what everybody's been saying about um, the importance of the the anterior posterior, but also the lateral forces that you you can't really get a lot of that from just the the plates that's, that look at vertical um, forces. So um, I, I do know that that's out there, and, and hopefully will be coming soon to uh, to to research uh, the pool out there that we have. Cool. Yeah. Keep me posted on that. I'd love to see anything because I just, it's something I'd love to have objective data on and see how individuals are loading through that and see what they're, um, but it, it requires these really advanced kind of laboratory based stuff that I don't know. I just don't think even advanced teams have, you know, everybody's just getting these vertical ones and we're still integrating those in D1 sports and pro sports. And I, you know, so be really cool to see that technology progress. Hopefully we have that in the next five, 10 years. Cool. Uh, does anybody have any, any other questions or thoughts, comments on all of this? Uh, just anything in overall in cutting? I have a general question for you, Ryan, or the group. Um, when you're first transitioning somebody into cutting and you're, like you said, you go about 70%, I think that's, that's a, reasonable place to start you don't want to start too slow um what are you cueing the athlete for if any are is it more of just progressive and introduction to that movement and allowing them to kind of get back to it to what feels comfortable or are you trying to coach them on specific movement strategies um, either to reduce injury or performance or anything like that because I, I feel like there's a mixture in the literature of what you should do with that or really not enough on that area? I think if there's anything like really egregious, like significant stiff knee strategy versus the other side, I, you know, first I'm going to look at probably what maybe their objective kind of strength is and make sure I'm not missing anything that they're, they're still really weak and maybe they're not even ready to start that cutting. Um, but if, if they have the capacity, right? So if the strength values look good, if they're able to, you know, squat with their body weight, some of those kind of, uh, you know, looking at two times their um, body weight for like a leg press. And it seems like they've got that triple extension control from a strength perspective. And they're still really stiff, you know, trying to integrate external cueing as much as I can. But I think in the early going, I will do some internal cueing, be like, you know, soft, soft knees or you know some of those strategies we kind of talked about last week and then as I'm progressing them so maybe stay at that 70 percent intensity and then try to have them progress them to more of an external cue or just no cueing at all well actually no cueing um, and then maybe provide those external reaction or cues and see how it's kind of playing into their form I think that's how I would go about it I do think you know obviously we're always trying to learn or progress motor control and provide those external cues but in the real world I do think sometimes you do any of those internal cues in the early phases hey Ryan I've got a couple comments um this is Kerry 
Uh, first of all, Liz and Ryan, really, really fantastic job with this um, interesting stuff and, and important stuff. So, so great job. Um, just a couple of comments, I guess, with mine with more kind of functional um, real world stuff. I, I thought your your comments on the rotational component um, where you're pre -orientate, pre orienting that rotation and, and based on, I think, that. Uh, maybe Haven's uh, uh, article. I think some of that goes back to um, drills that we often see uh, with baseball where they're working on disassociation, <clears throat> pelvis to hip to trunk, um, you know, stabilizing one, rotating the other, whether it's, whether it's rotation, whether it's um, anterior, posterior pelvic tilt, you know, some of those, those types of drills I think are, are beneficial in this regard um, work on that type of thing or assess can they do that even because if they can't keep it well then that takes you back to something else to work on prior to trying to work on that cutting um, so that's that's more uh, early stage type thing and then i think late stage something else i found and i want to get everybody's opinion on is you know you didn't talk anything about fatigue so I think working on some of those cutting drills um, and return fatigue versus not fatigue, what level of fatigue, I think that, that obviously plays a big role uh, in, in my opinion uh, in it also. Um, and then some of the late stage reaction uh, to cutting, just as a, I don't know, a pearl, I guess, is I will um, also use you know, the ACL, Injury mechanism, one, one mechanism is something happened that was unplanned, right? Um, somebody moved where they didn't plan. I stepped, um, you know, here where I thought I was stepping there. So I'll, I'll use uh, things like rolling balls at them, throwing a ball at them, throwing a football if it's because of the shape of the football on the ground uh, in front of them, and they have to react based on where that ball goes. Um, hitting them with a pad, you know, that type of thing. Um, just, just some of those unplanned events and when they're deemed ready for that, obviously not too soon. But just um, interested on, on focus thoughts on a couple of those things. Good job, great job. Yeah, I think that brings up another good kind of point to like Keith's question, just you know, maybe it's something where they're just really tight throughout their thoracic spine and they're having less rotation that's causing, you know, some breakdown down the chain. So I think if, I think going back to those objective measures of what the components are of a rotation and a pivot and a cut, if they're not performing it, when we start to introduce those motions at 70%, that's another good thought to carry. Another thing that I'll add sometimes um, with uh, respect to like reactionary cutting um, is, uh, is just doing it from a standstill. Um, so you don't always have to necessarily be moving to, uh, to need to have that reactive cut, um, both you know, um, offensively or defensively in field sports. And so I think that can be a nice, very safe way um, just to see how um, A, build a little bit of confidence with them, um, but then B, also um, kind of see their their natural footwork that they want to choose as they uh as they go from you know static uh static position to uh to whichever direction they have to turn and go that's a good point too brad about like i know you you live obviously a little bit more in the soccer world and just training those cuts to be offensive cuts and then defensive cuts so i i think that's important to cue in on the reactive side too Cool. Um, anybody else want to jump in at all? Any final kind of parting shots at all? This is a great discussion today. That was awesome. I think this is a topic that um, it's really, I think, you know, there's, it's hard to understand and it's hard to break down. And I think I took a lot away from our discussion today. So thank you very much, everybody, for being on and continuing with this. And uh, 
know, me, me and Vienna are always open to any feedback or any thoughts on, uh, you know, moving forward with our group here on, uh, you know, um, what types of lectures or things like that. So just keep us posted on anything. We're always open for that. So everybody stay safe. Uh, looking forward to having Niles on next week at 10 o'clock. Um, and if you want any of the articles, feel free to shoot me an email too. I've got PDFs of all those that can shoot them their way. Duke's access to articles is pretty, pretty awesome here. So let me know if you need anything. All right, everybody take care and uh, we'll see you next week.